Coming up, it's a number one smash with the distinction of having one of the most innovative and unforgettable music videos ever created. Made up of over 100 hours of filming, this song was written by an artist who lived on the fringes of pop culture stardom for decades. But after releasing this song and this amazing video, he was on everyone's radar. And in the process, he even one-upped his former bandmates, stealing the number one spot for one of their biggest hits. He replaced him at the top of the charts. So coming up, get the story of how this perfect slice of ear candy came out of nowhere to become an all-time 80s classic coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember watching The Muppet Show back in the day with some of those great musical performances, whether from The Muppets or like Elton John and other artists, you're gonna dig this channel nostalgia all the time. So goodbye, Make sure to subscribe below, click the bell so you get all the interviews. Also, check out our Patreon where you can get full interviews and other exclusive content. You can also become an honorary producer. So I'm excited today to get into the story behind a number one hit from one of the greatest albums of the 80s. Uh, also from one of the most innovative and imaginative artists out there. A man who left his former band and had been getting out charted and outsold by them with their new singer until he stole number one from them in 86 with Sledgehammer. Yep, I'm talking about Mr. Peter Gabriel and his landmark album, So. So let's rewind a little bit before we start. In 1975, Peter Gabriel announced to the world that after eight years, he was leaving Genesis to strike out on his own. And even though it was one of the most shocking pop culture events of the year, Gabriel wasn't leaving on bad terms. He respected his bandmates, but he also wanted greater artistic independence, you know, something he would find uh, in the solo albums that would follow. And while Genesis was you know, pushing ever closer to the mainstream, Peter Gabriel was happily living on its fringes. He even refused to add titles to his first four solo albums, but technically his fourth was called Security in the US. But that's not a strategy you implement if you're looking to capture mass popularity, said Gabriel about it. I originally thought I would avoid titles and make my records like magazines. When you look at a, a home in a pile of magazines, you remember them usually by the picture on the cover. I wanted it to look like a body of work, end of quote. Or in other words, they were not meant to be separate statements, but parts of a unified whole. But even if he was living on the edge of mainstream awareness, Peter Gabriel still managed a moderate amount of chart success in the US and quite a bit more in the UK. His solo debut, Salisbury Hill, uh, which we talked about in the past. That went to number 68 stateside, number 13 at home. Climbing up on Salisbury Hill. 1980s Games Without Frontiers reached number 48 in the US and number four in the UK. Looks could kill, they probably will in Games Without Frontiers. And then Shock the Monkey, that actually did a lot better in the US than the UK. Went to number 29 in the US as opposed to number 58 in the UK. Okay. And I guess maybe it's the arm's length approach to success that makes what happened with his fifth studio album so, so intriguing. <laughs> Peter Gabriel was practically the definition of a cold artist before breaking out with So in 1986. Think about it. And now he's actually naming his, his albums and he was hitting the top 40. What gives? So is Peter Gabriel's mainstream coming out party. A big party at that. Writing and recording So was a massive undertaking. The process began in May of 85, and it actually took Peter Gabriel a year to complete, almost to the day. Although, if you can believe it, this was the fastest record that Peter had ever made, known uh, kind of a running joke with Peter Gabriel. Typical of his solo career, though, Gabriel composed the music for So at his family home known as Ashcombe House. There he had a converted barn into an inexpensive studio. Uh, Gabriel co-produced the album with Daniel Lanois, you know, the two had already worked together on the soundtrack of the 1984 movie, Birdie. So it all began with Lanois, Gabriel, and uh, guitarist David Rhodes sitting in the studio rehearsing. Gabriel had prepared rhythms to use, and in some cases, a simple set of chord structures for Lanois and Rhodes to improvise around. 
We had a nice starting point, is what Lanois would say. Uh, he'd also go on to say, in that kind of scenario, it's not a good idea to have a lot of people around because you get nervous that you're wasting people's time while the song is you know, getting written. With just the three of them, approaches could be quickly changed, and in theory, there would be fewer dead ends. Still, ever the perfectionist, Peter Gabriel obsessed over the minutia of the record's sound. He spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to put it all together in the process. Lanois said that Gabriel's approach was so intricate that it, it bordered on forensic. As the album grew, Gabriel invited the rest of his team to the fold. There was engineer and mixer Kevin Killen, uh, bassist Tony Levin, and drummer Jerry Murata. Uh, they all contributed. And on top of that, Gabriel also employed percussionist Manu Ketche and Stuart Copeland, formerly of the police and violinist El Shankar. After a year's work, Gabriel's label Geffen was ecstatic with these results. So became one of the biggest selling albums for the label. It camped out on the U.S. Billboard charts for, uh, I think it was 93 weeks. It climbed all the way to number two. Incidentally, Genesis released their landmark album, Invisible Touch, less than a month after that. And uh, that topped out at number three. Just an observation. The material on So, it was, it was so rich and diverse. Even among the singles, a total of five were actually issued, four of which charted in the Hot 100. In Your Eyes, of course, went to number 26. Don't Give Up went to number 72. Big Time went to number eight. Red Rain didn't chart in the U.S., though I would argue it's the best song on the album. And of course, today's featured song, Sledgehammer, went all the way to number one. Sledgehammer was released on April 21st of 86, and it essentially smashed open the door for Peter to achieve mainstream appeal as a solo artist. However, the song was incredibly something of an afterthought. You know, with the recording of So Almost Complete, Gabriel started tinkering with a new groove, thinking that he would use it for you know, a future project. You could have a big dipper. As we further break down this amazing song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I always fashion here. With the new year upon us, it is a great time to change up your style and bring in the new with, with a cool look. Zenny has you covered with so many different options. You can go to zenny.com or download their new app, click our link below, and you can create your own pair. You choose your color, your shape, your style, and you add in your prescription and they send them right to your door. Check it out today. Going up and down, all around the bends. So as bassist Terry Levin remembered it, we were packing up and in typical Peter Gabriel fashion, he said, I have this idea for the next album. Would you mind just doing a run through of it? So we just reassembled the stuff and did a quick version or two of Sledgehammer. Its title, according to Lanois, came from the tongue-in-cheek construction worker language that he and Rhodes and Gabriel used throughout the sessions. I guess you know, during the making of so, the trio would show up to the recording sessions uh, wearing construction hard hats as a way to you know, lighten the mood, bring a little inspiration. Oh, Lanois thinks the gimmick uh, helped inspire the tune we decided that we would establish a regime, like a work ethic. So we had a bit of fun with the idea that we were turning up for work as if we were construction workers. We'd wear these uh, yellow hard hats. And I'd always say, let's hit it with a sledgehammer. You know, we'd get through the work day and there were a lot of references to the sledgehammer. I think that's where Peter got the title, end of quote. And just in case it went over your head when you were a kid, because um, it definitely did go over mine, Sledgehammer is all about sex. From top to bottom, it's just jam-packed with all kinds of sexual innuendo. Some implicit, some pretty blatant. Besides the image of a sledgehammer, you got a steam train, you got bumper cars bumping, a big dipper, and an airplane flying. If you don't 
It's a family channel, so I'm not gonna spell it out, but I'm sure you get the idea. Going up and down, all around the bends. At the time, Gabriel described Sledgehammer as an attempt to recreate some of the spirit and style of the music that most excited him as a teenager, 60s soul. The lyrics of many of the songs were full of a playful sexual innuendo, as he would say, and this was my contribution to that tradition. A sugar and spine. Never ends. Musically, Sledgehammer is massive. It just pummels your ears. It's chock full of sounds that, that take you from all sides. But clearly, one of the most defining aspects of the song's sound is the horn section, for which Gabriel brought in Wayne Jackson of the legendary Memphis Horns. Now, two decades earlier in 67, Gabriel saw Otis Redding and the Memphis Horns uh, play the London Club Ram Jam. And it was a formative experience for him and inspired him to want to become a full-time musician. Said Peter about the song, it was partly homage, and we tried to find whoever was left of the Memphis Horns. Wayne Jackson put a group together, and a part of the excitement of that session was hearing all these Otis Redding stories. The other part of the excitement was just how fantastic Sledgehammer sounded as a result of the Memphis Horns. Wayne Jackson put an already great song way over the top. Gabriel did get some criticism for this, however. Um, some claimed that he was copying the style of former bandmate Phil Collins to gain commercial success. You know, of course, Collins had previously used horns on you know, hits like Easy Lover and Sue Studio, and uh, to great effect. But Gabriel made it clear that this was never his intent. And he actually rebutted these accusations claiming that he was more of an influence on Collins going back to when they were bandmates in Genesis. Sledgehammer was so's first single. It was released on April 21st of 86, about a month before the rest of the album. And it really should get the credit for changing the entire course of Gabriel's career. But even more accurately, that credit goes to Sledgehammer's music video, right? Sure, the single on its own was poised to be a breakout hit, but there is no doubt that the video took it to a whole new level, and really probably why it was number one. You know, thanks to a fairly literal interpretation of the song's lyrics and some innovative filming techniques, the video for Sledgehammer was a wild roller coaster ride. I mean, literally. Gabriel's all over the road here, but in, in the best way possible. From steam trains to dancing chickens to a cool fruit salad to singing bumper cars to a stop motion dancing fest at the end, Sledgehammer feels like a grab bag of visuals you never expected to see in a music video. You're so glad you did. Now the video was directed by Stephen R. Johnson, whose work uh, Peter Gabriel greatly admired. Johnson had previously worked on the promo film for Talking Heads Road to Nowhere. That stunningly creative video, particularly its stop motion sequences, is what attracted Gabriel to Johnson. Johnson introduced Gabriel to the brothers Quay, who were leaders in their field, the technique known as stop motion, and Gabriel, in turn, introduced Johnson to Aardman Animations, uh, which was the, the British production house that would go on to make the Wallace and Gromit films. Ooh, I don't know, lad. It's like no cheese I've ever tasted. All the parties then teamed up to storyboard this video. What they came away with was a visually fantastic and innovative world, beyond anything anyone had ever created in the realm of music video. As you can imagine, the shoot was both time-consuming and labor-intensive. It took over 100 hours to film. David Sproxton of Arban Animation said, in those days, you had to do it all in camera. What you shot is what you got. You couldn't layer stuff in. 
This effectively made Peter Gabriel an animated model. Frame by frame, he was directed how to position his body, his head, you know, when the train was going around, where he was to look, and even how much to enunciate each part of the word that he was singing. At one point, Peter Gabriel had to stay in the same position for six hours for, like I said, 10 seconds of train track footage. That's some crazy dedication to your art. Could have a steam train. Took a lot of hard work is what Gabriel would say. I was thinking at the time, if anyone wants to try and copy this video, good luck to him. <laughs> the release of the Sledgehammer video signaled a seismic change in Peter Gabriel's commercial fortunes. Said Peter, I think the song would have fared okay because it did seem to work well on radio, but I'm not sure that it would have been as, as big a hit. And I certainly don't think the album would have been opened to so many people without this video. End of quote. Sledgehammer, it killed it across the world. It started in the US, it went to number one on the Billboard Hot 100, it went to number one on the Cashbox chart, the Album Rock Tracks chart, and the Hot Dance Club Play chart, triple threat there. It also went to number 10 in the Netherlands, number nine in Belgium and Sweden, and number seven in West Germany, number five in Italy, number four in the UK, Switzerland, and Finland. And it went to number three in Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Norway, and South Africa. It also went to number two in Austria, and it went to number one in Canada. Should have been number one in the UK. Since then, Sledgehammer has appeared in a few different movies and TV shows. There was Miami Vice, Rebound, Big Mama's House 2, Snow Angels, Everybody Hates Chris, and Eddie the Eagle. Sledgehammer has been covered by a lot of artists. There's Dave Matthews Band. Harry Styles, Sting, John Mayer, David Cook, and Bruce Hornsby. Unfortunately, as I touched on earlier, there were more than a few disparaging comments about Sledgehammer from industry tastemakers. Like I said, accusations that Gabriel was copying Phil Collins in his pursuit of the commercial fame and fortune of his solo career. They were, of course, baseless. But they made for an intriguing story, I guess. Come on, help me do. Come on, come on, help me do. I mean, you gotta remember that in the 80s, Phil Collins was a hit-making machine. Between Genesis and his solo career, Collins had eight. That's right, eight number one 80s hits on the Hot 100. Add to that another nine top 10 hits, and there's no denying that Phil Collins was a commercial monster. Conversely, Sledgehammer was Gabriel's only number one hit on the Hot 100 and only one of two top 10 hits. The second, Big Time, that came a little later, so then why wouldn't Peter Gabriel be jealous of his former bandmate? I mean, that was the narrative anyway. But Peter Gabriel put all that to rest. Everyone thinks Sledgehammer, you must have been trying to write a hit. It wasn't like that. I loved R&B, soul music, and so in a way, this was just a little bit of an homage to that, end of quote. And really, after Gabriel left Genesis, the two parties stayed on really good terms. They even joined forces to play a concert together in 82. And anyone familiar with Peter Gabriel knows that staying outside of the mainstream was always a deliberate choice. No, Peter wasn't keeping score. Gabriel commented in 86, I consider my approach to be very similar to 60 Soul, whereas I think Phil's style is more contemporary. In any case, I was definitely trying to borrow the style of that period. With regard to Phil, I respect his music and I would like my own to reach as large an audience as possible. I would strongly refute the suggestion that I'm just trying to copy him. That pisses me off because about the time of my third album, there were considerable stylistic changes in Phil's music, and I feel that my influence on him hasn't been fairly acknowledged. But even if Peter Gabriel wasn't gunning for his former bandmates, that didn't mean that he couldn't enjoy a few bragging rights, especially for that moment. For example, Sledgehammer 
it actually replaced Invisible Touch on the top of the charts. Now, years later, Phil Collins jested about it, saying, yeah, I read recently that Peter Gabriel knocked us off the number one spot with Sledgehammer. We weren't aware of that at the time. If we had been, we'd probably have sent him a telegram saying, congratulations, bastard. <laughs> and I think it's about the extent of the animosity. Another bragging right for Peter Gabriel was that he actually set a record for the most video music award nominations in a single year with 12. 10 of those were for Sledgehammer and Peter won nine of them, including video of the year, which he deserved, of course. Peter was up against some pretty stiff competition at the time though. The other nominees included uh, Paul Simon, Steve Winwood, U2, and yes, his former bandmates, Genesis. Additionally, Sledgehammer also won the British Video of the Year, once again besting his former bandmates who, let's be honest, they had an incredibly innovative video for themselves, Land of Confusion, the spitting image stuff. This was a music video that blew me away as a kid when I saw it, Sledgehammer. I remember watching it for the first time and then I just planned out like I did recording a song off the radio with my boombox. I had the VCR ready to record and when Sledgehammer was gonna come on, the moment it came on next. There was a lot of waiting around. I remember seeing a lot of Madonna and Whitney Houston videos to wait for it, but then it happened. And I just kept watching it to figure out how Peter did it. After about 20 watches, my mom came in. She was looking to watch a few of the episodes of her soap opera, uh, Days of Our Lives. She had recorded them. It turns out that I recorded over the opening of one of them that showed the result of a previous episode's cliffhanger. I got in trouble, of course, but it was worth it. The music video changed everything. And that's a sentence that was said quite a few times when it came to anything about Peter Gabriel. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Peter Gabriel and the Sledgehammer. What are your memories of the song, of this music video? What are your favorite parts? Let us know in the comments. If you dig our content, make sure that you subscribe below so you never miss out on our videos. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.